first thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak here today. <clears throat> I think it's appropriate that I say a few words about how I first met John. John probably doesn't remember this. I joined Exxon in 1965 with a degree in physical chemistry and interest in high politics. So for five years I did that kind of work. And I thought I was productively employed. I, mean, I was involved with a program, for example, that we were developing new ethnic program co-polymers and developing a replacement called Isidulee and is the main VI improver in our oil additives. And this work was successful eventually with commercial. Uh, I, I joined the analytical division because I was interested characterization. They had a very good group at the time doing the kinds of things I was interested in. And around 1969 or 1970, the fellow who ran the fraction lab uh, had requested a transfer to the Baton Rouge labs, and they granted that, which left this opening. And someone decided that because I had worked on x-rays and graduate school, that this was something that I should be doing. I uh, objected rather violently, and as it turned out, I actually did have a choice here. But before I decided to turn it down, I thought I should investigate it, and I went into the lab, saw what they were doing, uh, working with lots of powders, white powders, gray powders, and so on, said different catalysts. So I decided I should go talk to John. I'd never met John. So he was head of the catalyst for research. which uh, deal with some of the problems there. Let me just review um, quickly the problem in sort of pictorial form. I've got 
got here sort of a model bimetallic catalyst. And <coughs> one of the unique features of this is that, of course, the technique is element specific, which allows us to measure both edges of the bimetallic or all edges of the multi-metallic system. And the, the function for one particular atom type is generally a, a sum of two, two contributions, one from the A type of backscatter, one from, from the B. The same is true if we look at the B edge, we have two, two kinds of terms. And the form of that term is just here. It's the kind of thing that Carol showed in this discussion yesterday. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but the certain things in here are, are derived from standard materials, that is, either foils or conglomerated catalysts that we use as standards in sorting out material systems. Um, you can use metals for the pure systems. When it comes to the cross terms, though, the, the, the alloy type terms, we generally don't have models for that. So the methodology that we developed initially was centered around this phase shift function here. There are really four phase shift terms in this problem, one of an AA type, one of a BB type, there's an AB and a BA. And early in, in the development of XF, XF the, um, the notion of the additivity was put forth and that you could sum up all these, the sum of these phase shift functions, that is AA, BB is equal to AB plus BA. This is not precisely true, but it turned out to be a very useful approximation. So the approach that we developed was to use that relationship. We used a theoretical phase shift trial function, if you will, for one of the AB pairs, like AB or RBA, put forth by Tio and Lee at the time. And <coughs> the problem with this approach was that you didn't really know where you were on the energy scale. So in order to deal with it, we implemented uh, a condition which is implicit in this, that if you're looking from this atom out, the distance that you see to the opposite kind has to be the same distance that you see from this atom. So basically, RAB has to be equal to RBA. So we implemented that condition, in what I would call the loosely coupled approach, along with systematic shifts in the, the, the trial phase function based on putting in uh, delta Z, E0 or, or energy shift conditions. This allows you to develop an approach where you can map out the space at E0 and essentially find the right answer. Let me just go on to that. Uh, this is seen in the case of um, platinum rhenium. And I'll just show the, the, the edges here. Um, in the original work, I mean, rhenium and platinum are separated by three positions in the PRP table. And so you have all the edges sort of stacked up in the same place in space. Uh, this is a result, of course, of the fact that they're very similar. And it turns out that, that the overlaps don't really hurt you here. You can work with this region for the L3 edge for rhenium, and you can work with the platinum on one edge. There is a small overlap from the platinum on two, but it turns out that for you transforms out. So you do have essentially three regions to work with, but the fact is the elements are similar. And there are problems presented. Just to show you how the, the methodology was implemented, as I say, we selected various values of, of E0 for one of the phase shift pairs. That sets the other phase shift function. So you have all four. You can then go through an analysis, and what you get are, for each of these analyses is a distance for reading platinum and a distance for platinum reading. And you can do this over space and the point is that where they cross you take that correct answer because that condition has to be met. That, that is true regardless of what the structure of these species are. Now, uh, it, the, the top part of that plot just shows the composition about each one for that, uh, for those distances. The results that came out of that uh, answered a couple of important questions at the time. There was a lot of debate on the reducibility of rhenium, rather it was uh, was in fact reduced, and this work showed that it really was reduced. There was even question about whether there was any interaction between reading and platinum, and this work showed that. The problem with it was, though, there, there is a high correlation between N and sigma. And as a result of this, we were unable to get coordination numbers. Uh, what we did was to systematically vary these disorder terms over reasonable values and then look at the results. And it turned out that while the, the end values themselves scaled, the ratio of the terms didn't scale. They were pretty constant. 
So you can say with some uh, assurance what the, what the composition was. What you couldn't say was what the coordination was. So it, it didn't really address the issue, or it didn't allow us to address the issue of surface segregation. Um, I should say that in retrospect, now when we look back at all the systems that we've looked at, virtually sur surface segregation turns out to be the rule, not the exception. We've looked at a good many different systems. Um, I think only one case. shows very homogeneous compositions, and you would be hard pressed to make a case for surface segregation, but in virtually every other case, um, surface segregation has been ruled. So later we developed a, essentially an approach which uses more information, which also has to be, or which is also model independent. We use this condition in the previous, uh, the previous work, but it turns out that these relationships are also true. They're, they're completely independent actual model. The values, of course, depend on, on the nature of the, of the cluster. But the relationships themselves are independent of, of, the, of the nature of it. And so if you build these relationships now into this overall problem, what it does for you is it allows you to reduce the number of unknowns in the problem. And you get better uncertainty yes, but you also get a sort of a, a better solution to the problem. It allows you to put other kinds of relationships in should you know them from other experimental measurements. And I should say that for this work, we have now used more better theory than we had originally and, and the kind of thing that Merrill talked about, the FEM thing, uh, functions. We now simply calculate the phase functions and put, put them in. So when you do that and go back and look at this is the same data that, uh, that George struggled with when was it? 1985 or something. Uh, but using this other approach, uh, it turns out that some of the uncertainties fall out. And you're now able to, because you're, you're basically looking at a couple less, less, trying to find a couple less parameters, sigma spins fall out of this. And what you find is that uh, uh, the total coordination for platinum is around 9.5, and, and that for reading was around 6.5. And, and what it's telling you is that reading is a sort of segregated species. This is not intuitive, you wouldn't expect it. But it turns out to be found that every case where reading is present, it, turns out it is surface segregated. So we also get uh, sigma squared terms out of this. And so using this kind of approach really sort of enhances the information that we were able to get. It's, we haven't done any more measurements. We've simply brought uh, a somewhat more uh, exhaustive analysis approach to it. Let's, um, Let's turn now to platinum iridium. And I guess it's appropriate that after 25 years we're still talking about this. Uh, platinum iridium is even more difficult in the sense that they are adjacent to each other in the periodic table and <coughs> substantially overlap. Uh, the separation between the L3 iridium and platinum edges is uh, 350 volts. But the problem is that this domain here is rot not really enough to do very much with, it's too short. And so you end up working with this region, which is basically an overlap of the information from the two different edges. Now, early on, we realized that, that, that we had a serious problem here because the lattice parameters are very close. This was at a time when the numbers of 0.02 and 0.03 were generally said to be the area limits, and our limit here see is only 0.06 between the pure elements. So it was, I guess, with the sort of lack of knowledge that we set off on this, we could see that there was going to be a problem. So basically, what we, we the assumption we made was that we really could only determine two parameters. We could determine the average platinum distance, and we could determine the average radium distance. And then from that, and using something like Vigar's law, we should be able to make some statements about the system. Uh, the, it, the procedure that we developed to deal with this, I, sh I should say that, that in order to make this work, we had to have very high quality data, which we took at the time, fortunately. And the procedure that we, the, 
develop the sort of outline here, and it looks too complicated. But let I me mean, just basically the function that we're trying to analyze has two parts to it. There is one that comes from the, from the platinum term as a platinum metal distance. Um, there's a scaling parameter here, there's a, there's a sigma term here, and there is this, this term here, which comes from the overlapping meridian contribution. The problem is that the K scale that we're dealing with is the platinum K scale, and the iridium stuff is on its own its own K scale. That transformation is done here. This G, G function uh, is really a transformation of this function for iridium on to from one K scale to another. I won't, I won't go into any more detail on it, but it turns out that, uh, well, by specifying a value for this iridium metal, you can then crank through the solution and come out with a value for this, and you can do this over a range of values for the iridium. And what you find is, that these solutions are fairly well behaved. They go through, this we're plotting here, the uh, normalized fitting error for, each, for several different catalyst systems. They go through a well-defined minimum. Uh, this axis is the specified iridium metal distance, and on this axis we get flat. So as you change this value, this function goes through a well-defined minimum. Then we take that minimum as the solution of flat distance and for the iridium system. There are three catalysts depicted here. One is a 10% platinum, 10% iridium on silicon. One is a 1 1 case, and then this is on aluminum. Um, okay, let me just show, uh, summarize the results that we got for this. I really want to focus on this one because of what we're working with. But here I show the characteristics for platinum metal and for iridium metal. And the results that we got, in particular here, show that the platinum distance, the average platinum distance, is in fact different than the average iridium distance. Now, I should say that we have done the fraction work on all of these systems before this, and in particular this system, because it is basically uh, comprised of rather large crystallized chemisorption. Shows a dispersion of about 0.24. That corresponds to roughly 50 angstrom particles. These things are relatively stable in air. They can be exposed. There's no oxidation. And what we found by X-ray diffraction was very well-defined diffraction lines at exactly the midpoint between pure iridium and pure platinum, suggesting a 50-50 homogeneous alloy. So that was our view at the time until we got this, and we said, well, there's something else going on here. Uh, we speculated at the time that uh, we could, there were really two, two possibilities. We could be dealing with a mixture of two different concentrations of platinum iridium. In retrospect, I think that's probably not right. But we could probably rule that out. The other model was that we actually had a surface segregated system in which iridium was the core, and platinum was the exterior. And the diffraction essentially giving us an average distance for the whole cluster. But the individual distances are, in fact, different. Um, sort of keep these distances in mind. I, the same thing showed up for, uh, for the more dilute systems, and the, uh, there's actually a, a bigger separation of these distances you go down, suggesting that there's, there's still maybe, while we don't have uh, any large clusters, maybe we have ramps in which the same kind of thing prevails. Well, <coughs> Somewhat later, and I should say that again, while it showed us that we had probably a situation which, which was clearly homogeneous and which there was certain segregation, we really didn't have definitive proof of that. And we were still dealing with a situation in which the differences were very small. It turns out later that um, we acquired a 30 mile array germanium detector. And these detectors really come into their own very dilute systems, or measure biological systems for metal concentrations extremely low. But they can also be used in other ways. And uh, because of the energy resolution, which is about 300 volts uh, on these, or practically much better than about 350 volts, uh, you can actually use it to do energy discrimination and where you have multiple signals. So what I'm showing here is the uh, fluorescence energy distribution from a platinum 
system. There's a doublet here which arises from the original output and the fibernal output. The albedas are here, and this, these peaks here really come from a combination of the and the scattering. And what you're able to do here is to window portions of this out. So you can, for example, snip a bit of radiation here and a bit of radiation here and get what are essentially spectrally pure signals. I mean, it's terribly inefficient. You're throwing away, I don't know, 99.9% .9 of the counts, but, but what you get back is a spectrally pure signal, so you don't have this overlap. And we have done that for this 10% system, 1010 system. do that, we've got actually pretty good data out to a K of 16 or 17 here, and you get these numbers back directly. The, this, the assumption here is that we are using iridium metal as a reference here, pipe metal as a reference here, we're using phase functions and put them for the pure metal cross terms, which should show that that approximation makes a very small difference in the error in the, uh, the distance like the money order. So basically, uh, you can, if you do this kind of approach, you get the numbers back that you got from this much more complicated decomposition directly in a matter of five minutes. Now having done this, and now having data which are, which allow us to do more analysis, we're attempting to, to go one step further and apply the, sort of the full conditions to, to the analysis of the multi-edge approach. And this is what comes out of that. Uh, on the top field and on the bottom field, uh, I just put the values for platinum degree of reference materials. So the platinum edge is described here. We, we get two distances out of this. The platinum platinum is 2.756 in the middle. I'll come back to that in a minute. This distance is slightly larger. It's the same here, of course. The radium distance is very close to that for, uh, for the reference. But the platinum distance is, again, considerably contractible. The average of these are just the numbers, or some of the numbers that I just showed you, and sort of the grand average is 2.74, which is what we get in the fraction. So if you start from here you're, you're, and work your way back, you're getting more detail about the structure. In other words, this is what the fractions tell you. That's kind of the average distance. <coughs> the average platinum distance of the over here, and if you take it, pull it apart further, you can see the individual distances. The coordinations that come out of this, the coordination numbers, um, first of all, these values come out to be 0.8. Uh, platinum platinum is around 10 and a half. Iridium is 12 and a half, and if you add these up, we're getting 11, 3, and 13, 3. Now, obviously, the, the system is going to be more than 12, but there are errors in this total process, and I think this kind of uh, shows you the, the level of error, but on the other hand, this number is smaller than this by about the error limit, so I think there's some justification in saying that this supports the notion that platinum is a base, is the surface segregated phase. Now the question is, uh, do these numbers have any sense in reality? In other words, if you model the system, what would you get? And it turns out that you can do that. Uh, and one of the reasons you can is because these are relatively large clusters. And so these folks uh, have enumerated for icosahedral systems essentially all the coordination numbers that uh, they should build this thing up from different uh, increasing uh, numbers of atoms. And what we did was to start with the measure of the Kimmy's orbit, basically, that said the dispersion is 0 0.24. Let's ask the question, what icosahedron, how big does the icosahedron have to be to have that kind of surface volume ratio? And it turns out it has to have 5,083 atoms. Okay, and that has a surface fraction of 0 0.244. It has an edge length of 12. That is to say there are 12 atoms going out. Now, if you 
say half of those are iridium and go into the cluster first, then you can take that number, put it into the cluster, and that corresponds to an oncosity of 9.6. The remaining half of the atoms now goes into the outer two or two and a half shells of, of, of atoms. So it's like we're almost dispersing platinum onto the three and four. So platinum can almost be used as highly dispersed here. If you go through that, you can compare the model with the measure, and you would predict that you know, from the model that the platinum coordination would be 10.4, the iridium is 12. Uh, when you're measuring 11.3 and 13.3, the difference is about the same. And you can calculate the size of that cluster. And I did that by just taking the inscribed uh, uh, sphere, which corresponds roughly to the fraction box, which you see. And you get 50 action versus 49 for extra fraction. So um, I think that this is at least uh, evidence, and it's certainly much more evidence than we had in the past that, that, that platinum is, in fact, a surface segregated species. And I think you can do this and or make this comparison here because we're dealing with large clusters. This is going to fall down, I think, when you go to much more highly dispersed. One final point, the, this, this distance, I said, the platinum distance that comes out of this is 2.75, basically 200 of an angstrom, less than the pure metal. If you look at pure platinum on solar, you invariably get numbers in which the, the distance is the same as the bulk. So this, the fact that we're seeing a short distance here is, is I think, significant. And the places where we see that, or have seen it in the past, are ones in which the platinum is highly dispersed. We see it in aluminum, and I think Farrell was showing it in some of the things he was modeling yesterday. Um, the reasons for it are either because of the increase in the Bywaller factor or for some other reasons. But the fact is, we see that when we have a high, high dispersion. When we don't have high dispersions, we see Distances that are very characteristic of the metal. So, just to conclude, briefly, I think the, uh, the point is that by using this multi edge approach, we're able to get more detailed information than a normal sequential approach. And I think we have evidence from this now that both reading uh, and platinum are certain segregated. Any questions? Well, you did an excellent job of convincing. The next speaker is Howard Sherry, who will uh, describe ion exchange and zeolites.